Hey everyone, and welcome back to the channel. My name is Ryan from Tragedy Tales, and on this channel, we cover anything tragic related. Any true horror story, we'll cover it here. So if that's your kind of content, head down below and smash that subscribe button. Caving is actually very safe. Although the environment is often claustrophobic and alien, chances are if you've prepared and trained accordingly and make sure you don't go alone, most caves are very safe. Although caving accidents are rare, they do happen, often with fatal results. So here are a handful of lesser known but equally as chilling caving horror stories, in no particular order. Fern Cave is located in Alabama. This particular cave was discovered in 1961, and when they tried to map it, it proved to be a truly monumental task. Now, Fern Cave has a total of five entrances, one of which is appropriately named Surprise Pit. The Surprise Pit entrance includes one of the deepest vertical drops in North America. It scares even the most veteran of Spelunkers. Now, on November the 2nd, 1997, Alexia Hampton, her husband, and a friend had planned to explore Fern Cave via the Surprise Pit entrance. Now, Alexia, she was an experienced caver, and so were her husband and her friend. In the morning, the group set off to the cave. They drove for three miles on an unpaved road, followed by a lengthy uphill hike to get to the entrance. They reached the mouth of the cave, and they started their descent. The sound of running water echoed through the chambers as they made their way through. Suddenly, you are met with a truly eerie, pitch black hole. It is in fact 437 foot deep. The beginning of the pit is as tight as the passageway, but it soon opens up to around 200 feet across, spanning into a vast chamber. To get past this, you have to rappel from the top of the pit to the bottom to then continue on through the cave. The rope was described as thin and was fed through by a metal rack. Now this is something that they had done before many times. So her husband rappelled and so did her friend. Alexia was the last to follow. She stepped off the rocky face and the rope slid through her hands. She repelled through the pit at great speed. Her headlight only illuminated herself and the rope in the pitch black. Now as she repelled, the two below noticed that she was not stopping near the end, as you usually would. The end of the repel was described as going out of control. She slammed straight into the rock pile at the end and fell 67 feet to the floor. Her husband and her longtime caving friend had to watch this ordeal play out. They could see her headlights spinning and turning as she fell in the pitch black, knowing they could do nothing to help. They rushed over and she was in complete agony. She had sustained a multitude of severe injuries. Her internal organs were scrambled, causing a variety of internal injuries and bleeding. She had sustained a compound fracture to the lower left leg and ankle. She had also fractured her right femur, a life-threatening injury. Her husband rushed to the cave entrance, as they always do, and he called for rescue. Rescue teams traversed down the 404 feet pit as quickly as they could to find Alexia on her back in extreme amounts of pain but in good spirits, telling the rescuers she would be fine. However, the rescue itself would not be so easy. As she had two pretty bad leg injuries, she could not climb out from where she had reached meaning she had to be on a stretcher the entire time. Luckily, the passageways of this cave aren't too narrow, so it was possible, but it was going to be an arduous journey. They strapped her to an orange specialist cave stretcher and began hauling her out of the cave. The rescue was going as planned. She was still in good spirits, but complaining of intense pain throughout. The rescuers spent hours, and eventually they saw the light at the end of the tunnel. They all breathed a sigh of relief. Through the skin of their teeth, she'd made it. As the light of the entrance grew closer and closer, they suddenly noticed that they could not hear moaning from the stretcher anymore. They looked down and they found that Alexia was not breathing. She had gone into cardiac arrest from shock. They immediately dropped the stretcher and began CPR, but they soon found that this was in vain. She had passed away just 50 feet from the entrance of the cave. A truly heartbreaking and just tragic end. Her husband was of course distraught and so was her friend. She was later laid to rest but he vowed he would never go caving again.
February the 12th, 2015, a 50 year old, very experienced caver named Gordon had planned to explore the Bull Pot Cave in the West Yorkshire Dales with his friend. The Yorkshire Dales are home to many other limestone caves that are very similar. The cave consisted of four pitches and was around 262 feet in length. Now on the morning of February the 12th, 2015, the two cavers donned their equipment and entered the cave, abseiling down to the first pitch. Now as the two of them were very experienced cavers, there was little to no obstacles in their way. Progress was smooth and they were enjoying the explore. After abseiling all the way to the final pitch, access to further parts of the cave involved a squeeze where you would crawl on rocks on your hands and knees through a tight passageway something both of them were used to doing. So Gordon decided that he would enter first. He got on his hands and knees and started to crawl through the passageway. His friend stopped for a drink and heard the sound of him crawling on pebbles. As he took that drink, at that moment, everything was fine. But this is when the crawling suddenly stopped and a large thud was heard. He shouted back to ask if he was okay and there was no response. He rushed over and got low to take a look down the passage and here he saw Gordon on the floor with his back facing him. He was kneeling on one knee and the other stretched behind him, with a huge flake of rock on top of him, described as weighing well over a ton. Now the caving friend tried to move it, but obviously it was far too heavy and it just wouldn't budge. They checked for a pulse and none was found. As there was nothing he could do, he returned to the cave entrance and called for help. Now rescue arrived and made their way to the passageway, but upon getting there, it was quickly realized that there was nothing that could be done to save his life. The rock had broken free as he walked through and it hit him straight in the neck, instantly killing him. Now the rescuers carried out an 8 hour recovery operation to get him out. They tried many different methods of extracting his body, but in the end they broke the rock into several pieces to free Gordon. They packaged him up and he reached the mouth of the cave, where he was officially pronounced dead. His death was ruled an accident and while the reason for the rock becoming loose is unknown, it's suspected it was loosened by recent minor earthquake tremors. But this cannot be proved. This particular rock had been in place for literally thousands of years. Hundreds of people had crawled under it before, and it's just really unlucky that it just so happened to come loose as he was crawling underneath. This story begins in the Onine Well. The Onine Well is one of the deepest caves in Texas. The cave itself is of historical importance and has been used for centuries. Its discovery date is unknown and a windmill is still used to draw water from the cave today. Now the cave itself is essentially a 328 foot almost vertical pit. The entrance of the cave is a straight 127 foot drop that requires a wetsuit and a high skill proficiency on a rope to be safely traversed through. So it's not a beginner's cave. Now the cave continues down five more ropes to a sump. Leading to the sump is a large, very slippery mud slope, making getting down to the sump very difficult. Now the people involved in this story were Joe Ivy and his friend Tim. Joe was an avid caver. He was the guy that you would go to if you wanted a cave mapping, and he was just an expert in this field. In the April of 2000, they entered the 09 Well Cave. They rappelled down the 127 foot entrance and reached the first plateau. After getting there, they looked up and saw what they thought was an infeeder in the ceiling that Joe believed may well lead to more unexplored cave passages. So, in around March of 2000, they started planning to climb this rock face to see if their hypothesis was true. Now, they planned this meticulously, safety being at the forefront. They had all the expertise and brought all the necessary pieces of equipment to tackle the climb. The two entered the cave in early August and began rigging to the infeeder. They took it in shifts to avoid exhaustion. They used a cordless hammer and a drill and several types of protection in addition to expansion bolts. Now on the first day of the trip, Tim and Joe both took falls as they took turns ascending the rock face and the rigging easily absorbed the energy of the fall. However, these falls were relatively small, ranging from around 10 to 13 feet. So not insane falls by any means. Joe and Tim made a total of five trips to continue working on the climb. On the very last weekend of September the 30th, 2000, they had successfully cleared a section of the climb covered in thick clinging mud. After a truly arduous amount of work, they were finally nearing the end. Tim was close to the passage. By looking in, he could make out a low crawlway that appeared to go off in one direction, but it looked like the lead rope would not reach the top, and Tim was completely exhausted and out of hangers anyway. So this is when Tim decided to end his shift. Tim rappelled down to rest, and Joe began what would be his last trip. Now Joe was fully rested, in good spirits, and ready to finish the task. 
Around 45 minutes in, Tim heard a gasp from Joe and then a blood curdling large crash. Now mud and other parts of rock had fallen while doing this and made a similar crash, but this was much, much larger. Tim called up to Joe, but there was no response. And more alarmingly, Tim looked up and saw there was no headlight where Joe was previously rigged. He instantly knew something terrible had happened. Tim screamed for Joe again, and one of the cavers in the cave at that time, called Sarah, called back out. Tim shouted to Sarah that he needed help ASAP. Sarah passed the message on to her caving companion, and he instantly started ascending to the surface to call for help. Tim began to hear Joe crying in pain and trying to say something. The voice was coming from a point well below the lead rope, which was really worrying. As Sarah already had her climbing gear set up, she began making her way to the sound of the voice, while Tim rigged himself to assist. She descended lower into the cave, and there she found Joe. He had fallen 40 to 60 feet from his rigging, onto the steep mud slope. Here, he had been wedged between a slot between chalk stones and the cave floor, on the muddy slope just above the sump. An absolutely terrible spot to be in. If he fell further, he was almost certainly dead. Blood smears were all over the walls where he had fallen and his helmet was missing. Sarah was stood at the top when Tim arrived. Here, Tim climbed down to the muddy ramp and stood on a very uneven and tiny ledge that is barely large enough to sit on. Here, he tried to assist Joe from behind. Now, the first thing that Tim noticed was the fact that Joe was not attached to any rope whatsoever. He quickly made an overhand knot in the rope and used two carabiners to stop him sliding further into the pit. Joe was conscious, so he asked of his injuries. He replied, left arm broken and can't breathe. With this, Tim tried to pull Joe out of the slot, grasping at his right arm. He pulled Joe, and Joe screamed in agony. Tim stopped, but Joe said that everything hurts, so just do it anyway. With this, he asked Joe to kick his legs as he pulled. He did this, and eventually he came out of the slot that he had been wedged in, but not fully. As it was kind of stable here, Tim thought that this would be the best place to attend to Joe's injuries. Joe was loudly complaining that he could not breathe. His harness had ridden up around his chest and was constricting his ribcage. Now this harness was a butt strap harness without leg loops. Normally this type would have an additional strap that would prevent the harness from riding up, but Joe had removed this when he bought it. They did think about removing his harness so he could breathe, but if he took it off, he had nothing stopping him falling into the pit. So they decided they just needed to get him off the ramp. They continued pulling, but the angle of the ramp was just too steep to allow Joe to pull up onto the small ledge. Sarah got onto the small ledge behind Tim. Unfortunately, at this stage, Joe had lost consciousness, but he still seemed to be breathing sporadically. Sarah and Tim tried to move him again, but his body was covered from head to toe in slippery mud. The only place that they could grab him to pull him up was the harness, the very thing that was killing him. They finally managed to get him on the ledge, but quickly, he slid back down into an even lower position than he was before. At this point, it was sadly obvious that Joe had stopped breathing and had no pulse. But the precarious position he was in, it was impossible to administer CPR. Eventually, Joe was finally freed, and instead of pulling him onto the ledge, they lowered him to the bottom of the muddy pit, where he was rushed to a flat part of the floor to start CPR. Tim frantically looked around for his knife to cut off his harness, but he couldn't find it. Of course, perfect timing, this is when rescue arrived at the bottom of the pit to assist. The rescuers, who were paramedics, performed CPR for a short time, but it was given way too late to save his life. Further assistance arrived at the surface, and Joe's lifeless body was packaged for hauling. Joe finally reached the surface at 4pm on October the 1st, 2000. After his death, people entered the cave and examined the lines that he was using at the fall. None of the pegs in the walls were damaged, and it looked like Joe had all the equipment he needed. However, upon further examining the scene, an assumption could be made of what happened. Due to the flaws in their unique way of running belay, this caused extreme pressure on the equipment used. Examining the rope, the rope was put under immense stress and snapped, causing him to fall. His cause of death was later found to be massive damage to his ribcage, caused by extreme pressure of the harness as he fell, so not actually from the fall itself, if he had not made that amendment to remove the strap, the harness would not have been able to rise up like it did, and he still may be here today. Joe was a pioneer when it came to caving, and he will forever be missed in the Texas caving community. So that was three caving tragedies. My condolences go out to everyone in this video's family and friends. Out of the three, 
I would say Alexia was the worst. Getting all the way to the entrance and then passing away like that is just truly tragic. But other than that, I hope you enjoyed the video. I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.